Welcome to 2819. I'm Sandra Dimas. And I'm Brian Rollenbacher. And we hope you're ready for today's show because we have some deep topics we're going to be tackling. That's right. We'll be hearing from RTB visiting scholar Pat McGuire, philosopher and theologian Ken Samples, and we're also going to be hearing from John Lennox in our Nexus segment. I hope you're all feeling ready for that. But first up, we have RTB 101. Krista Bontrager will be talking with biochemist Fuzzle Rana as he answers the question, does the fossil record prove the evolution of whales? Yep, let's check it out. Now it's time for RTV 101, where we discuss practical questions to equip you to share your faith more effectively. And here to help me talk about a very common evidence that's often put forth for biological evolution is my colleague, Dr. Fuzz Rana. Welcome, Fuzz. Krista, hi, how are you? We're doing well. We're staying well here during the quarantine. We're very grateful for the technology so that the show can go on. Um, I want to talk today about this issue of the evolution of whales, because if anyone picks up a high school biology textbook, there might be some parents watching today and they might look in their student's high school biology textbook. They're going to find a section about whale evolution. And so I thought maybe we could help make sense of this for our viewers. And so maybe you can first start off and describe what people are going to see in their textbooks about whale evolution. Yeah, well, um, the, the claim that you see on the part of evolutionary biologists is that whales evolved as mammals from land-based mammals. And oftentimes there's a creature called Pachycetus, which is a wolf-like creature that is envisioned as living near the water's edge that gave rise to a lineage that culminates in the emergence of modern whales, where each of these members in that lineage uh, develop over time an elongated body where their, their limbs become shorter and shorter and eventually evolve into whales. And their tails eventually develop into a flipper like structure. And presumably, you have fossils in the, the, uh, the geological record that document this evolutionary transition so that you have this very impressive sequence of transitional forms that are, again, documenting this, this evolutionary transition at the water's edge from land into the oceans. So help us understand why this is seen as such a powerful uh, evidence that it is almost universally put into high school biology textbooks. How does it show evolution from the evolutionary point of view? Well, I mean, one of the key predictions of the evolutionary paradigm is that there should be evidence in the fossil record for evolutionary transformations. And yet, when you look at the fossil record, you really see a dearth of evidence that seemingly documents these kinds of evolutionary transformations. It's not to say that they're not these fossils that are, are uh, interpreted as transitional forms, but the actual series of uh, transitions is usually inferred from a very sparse fossil record. And so what we see with the whale series is what appears to be this incredibly beautifully documented series of transitional forms documenting a key evolutionary transformation. And because of its unusual, of its unusual nature, because of, of the, the quality of the fossils, people will point to this as a quintessential example of evolution being documented in the fossil record. But it's not uh, typical. It is a rare example. And that's why it shows up in, in biology textbooks. That's very helpful. Now, we at Reasons to Believe, I like to say that we're kind of skeptics that natural process evolution can adequately account for the history of life. I'm wondering what potential uh, problems do you see with this kind of wolf-like creature evolving into a whale uh, creature? What are some potential issues that you have with that? Yeah, well... Um... I would agree that on the surface, this seems to be a very impressive example of evolution being documented in the fossil record. But when you begin to press on some of the details, I think you, you see um, aspects of this quote unquote evolutionary transformation that, are, that raise some, some uh, questions. For example, this transition presumably happens in a time scale of less than 10 million years, where 
Pachycetus is in existence about uh, 55 million years ago, and the transition is complete by 45 million years ago. So within a window of time of less than 10 million years, you have a wolf-like creature that lives on the land undergoing a complete uh, reworking of its anatomy and physiology to be adapted to live in the open oceans. It's hard to envision how that kind of evolutionary transformation could happen that quickly when we see other quote unquote transitions in the fossil record like the, the horse series, where you go from a small horse that's about the size of a dog to horses as they are now, we, as we now know them today, much larger, where there is a restructuring of the foot and a restructuring of the dentition. This is a relatively minor change that takes about 60 million years to transpire. Hard to imagine how that could happen in 10 million years. Uh, and, and then on top of that, there's a lot of uncertainty about the precise evolutionary pathway and evolutionary relationships. For example, there are some people who claim it wasn't Pachycetus that was the creature that inaugurated this evolutionary series, but other uh, fossils have been attributed as being the, the whale ancestor, like a deer-like creature or a raccoon-like creature. Uh, or if you go to uh, the anatomical uh, features and build evolutionary trees that way, or the genetic features and build evolutionary trees that way, you get very different evolutionary trees, whether it's using genetic data or using anatomical data. So the bottom line is that uh, the, while superficially this transition looks pretty impressive from the fossil record, the details really raise questions about, is this the best explanation for whale origins? So when we're looking at this same evidence from an old earth creation model perspective, I'm wondering how do we look at it? How do we see it? How do we interpret this same data? Well, we would say that these uh, fossils are describing real organisms that existed, many of them at the water's edge, that based on the fossils that we've discovered, they seem to be perf perfectly and ideally adapted to live and to thrive at the water's edge. So we would see them as the product of a designer. Now, these so-called transitional forms actually co-occur in the fossil record. They are not uh, appearing uh, sequentially in the fossil record, but they all show up at the same time. And so this idea of a sequence is really a, an interpretation that's imposed on the fossil record, not an interpretation that flows out of the fossil record. But evolutionary biologists will also say, well, these creatures have a mosaic of properties that they interpret to be transitional in nature. But you could also see those mosaic properties as, again, reflecting the work of a designer. So uh, to me, I think you could easily interpret the fossil record and specifically the whale, these whale fossils, as being fully compatible with an old earth creationist position. They don't demand an evolutionary interpretation. Well, thanks, Fuzz, for helping us out today. And I do want to invite our viewers to go check out Fuzz's blog. It's called The Cells Design, and it is at reasons.org. Next up, we're going to hear from our friend, Dr. John Lennox, and he's talking about the greatest apologetics challenges of our time. Let's check it out. I think there are many major challenges that we have to think about. The hardest question is and has always been the twin problems of moral evil and natural evil, the problem of pain, as C.S. Lewis called it, because there are no simplistic answers and one has to find a way in that deals at two levels. First, the intellectual level for those that observe the evil and then at the pastoral level for those who are experiencing it. And those are two very sensitive things. They're person-specific, they're situation-specific. And as I get older, I see that again and again as one of the central issues. The other major issue is the dealing with the problem of the confusion over the nature of faith because the new atheists have managed to propagate the idea very successfully that faith is a religious word and it means believing where there's no evidence and i want to combat that very strongly to point out that faith is an ordinary word in english it derives from the latin fides and it's only credible insofar as it's evidence-based 
And I want to point out that science in that sense, at its very heart, involves faith. It involves the conviction, the belief, the faith that the universe is rationally accessible or mathematically accessible. Science doesn't give you that. You have to believe that before you can do any science. So scientists in that sense are people who cannot avoid a faith commitment in order to do their science. And what I say about science, where evidence base is claimed for their commitments, I want to say exactly the same thing about Christianity, that what the New Testament requires of us, what Christ requires of us, is an evidence-based commitment, as is explained at the end of John's Gospel. Jesus did many other signs which are not written in this book, but these are written that you might believe. In other words, John is a book of signs, pointers, on which credible faith can be based. And so it is a huge challenge because of the confusion to really get people's ideas about faith straight. To watch the full clip, go to the Reasons to Believe YouTube channel and search John Lennox. Now it's time for Culture Talk, where we discuss culturally relevant topics that you can use to start conversations about your faith. I'm joined today with astronomer Hugh Ross. Thank you for joining us. Oh, you're welcome. We're going to be talking about a common question that we receive, and it is whether or not dinosaurs are mentioned in the Bible. And believe it or not, I was a late convert. You might already believe that, but as a late convert, the first apologetic question that somebody posed to me is, what about the dinosaurs? So as a skeptic, they were convinced that dinosaurs are not mentioned in the Bible. And kind of a common conception that a lot of people have, um, Christians and non-Christians, is that um, the Bible teaches a young earth and dinosaurs went extinct millions of years ago. So something isn't, isn't accurate. So how do we look at that? Well, your skeptic friend was right. Mm -hmm. The Bible does not ever discuss dinosaurs, doesn't discuss Neanderthals either. It's giving us the highlights of God's creation miracles mm -hmm. and dinosaurs simply don't make the cut. Although I'd argue they're implied in Psalm 104, mm -hmm. where it talks about God creating life and it's a property of life to die off, but God recreates. So there's these recreations and dinosaurs would fit in there. Uh, but I think where people get confused, they think the book of Job is addressing dinosaurs right. when in fact it's not. So then let's look at those. So in Job 40 and 41, we have the behemoth and the Leviathan mentioned. Right, right. So they're used, they're described as having tails um, that sway like cedar. And this is the behemoth. Mm -hmm. Um, its bones are tubes of bronze. And for the Leviathan, it's double coat of armor, mouth ringed with fearsome teeth and flames that stream from its mouth. So if Job 40 and 41 are not referring to dinosaurs, then what are they referring to? Well, notice that dinosaurs don't have flames coming out of their mouths. They don't have tubes of bronze in their legs. Uh, when you look at Job 40 and 41, I counted it. 21 times you see the words as and like. Mm. So you've got metaphorical language weaved in with right. literal language. And that, I think the metaphorical language is implying how you as a human being would feel if you're confronted with one of these animals up close mm. uh, with no weapons in your hands. This is how you're gonna feel. Right. But then you see weaved in it actual, the fact that the behemoth that lives in the water is difficult to see, it's vegetarian. Uh, talks about the Leviathan being a carnivore, having these fearsome teeth. Mm -hmm. That's all literal. But I think you need to look at it in the larger context of Job 38 right through to 42. Job 38 talks about the soulish animals, mm -hmm. uh, the birds and the mammals, and basically makes the point some are easy to tame, some are difficult to tame. And when it gets to Job 40 and 41, it says these are the two that are the most difficult. Mm -hmm. Dinosaurs are not part of the nephesh animals, the soulish animals. So it's not talking about them. It's talking about two very difficult to tame uh, creatures. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and basically it's making the point that we humans are similar. Some of us are easy to tame. Some of them are difficult to mm -hmm. tame. And also Job 42 ends by saying, no Job and your friends, it took a higher being to tame these animals. Likewise, it takes a higher being, it takes me to bring humility to a proud human heart. So there's a spiritual lesson here. But as you look at the two animals that are the most fearsome to human beings, that are soulish, 
difficult to tame. It is possible to tame the behemoth. It is possible to tame the Leviathan, but there are no two more difficult soulish animals to tame than these two. And people living hundreds of years ago who had intimate contact with wild animals all understood this must be a reference to the hippopotamus and the Nile crocodile. Wait, you mentioned people living hundreds of years ago? Yeah, when they were reading these scriptures, mm -hmm. I think what's happened in the 21st century, we're familiar with dinosaurs, we've lost contact with wild animals mm -hmm. that was common to people living hundreds of years ago. And when you read ancient commentaries in the Bible, you really see there was a consensus. This is clearly the hippopotamus, this is clearly the, uh, the crocodile. And when you read the literal text mm -hmm. in Job 40 and 41, it really does fit. Okay, so I see what you mean. So the people reading hundreds of years ago prior to us having discovered dinosaurs, the existence of dinosaurs, right, right. so they understood it to be um, crocodiles, you said? The and, crocodile, that's the leviathan. The behemoth is the hippopotamus. Right. And the tail like a cedar, a hippo has a very tiny tail. Mm -hmm. But what, the word that's translated as the tail like mm -hmm. a cedar actually refers to the entire hind quarters of the animal. Mm -hmm. When you look at the hippopotamus, it's got very powerful hind quarters and it uses it as a weapon against creatures that dare to come into its territory. It's a, it, as it says in the text, it eats vegetables, mm. uh, but it's highly territorial. If you come into its territory, it's going to attack you and it attacks you with its powerful rump. That's how it capsizes canoes of people get too close right. to these creatures. Well, I think that's a helpful distinction in, in understanding the people who read the Bible before the, this discovery or these discoveries of dinosaurs and what they understood it to, to be. And then us reading it in kind of a current understanding, um, we view it with that lens without necessarily understanding. Yeah, it's true, Sandra, but I think people are also losing the larger context. They're looking at Job 40 and 41 mm -hmm. and ignoring Job 38 and 42. Right. You need to read it in context. So how would you respond to someone who might challenge you and say, well, Christianity can't be true because scientific evidence points to dinosaurs existing millions of years ago. Like, How would you help them understand that we have both biblical and scientific evidence that affirms? Our well, up there, I think you're dealing with this misconception that the Bible is a young earth book. It's not. Right. It's an old earth book. And I would take them through the text and, they, and basically just say again, read everything that text has got to say. Mm -hmm. In terms of uh, Job 40 and 41, let's begin with Job 38 verse 1 and carry it right through to the end of the book. Let's see what the larger context, I think when people see that there's a spiritual message in here, it really clarifies what the behemoth and the Leviathan must be. Right. Well, thank you so much for that. I love that what we're learning here is that when we approach the Word of God, it isn't necessarily clear. We need to keep looking and keep studying and to glean more and more from God's Word. And have our skeptical friends actually read. I mean, let's yeah. just let's read those four chapters right. and see what they got to say. So there's a lot to unpack here. Where would you have our viewers go to for more information? Well, I cover this in detail in my book, Hidden Treasures in the mm. Book of Job. There's a whole chapter on Job 40 and 41. Thank you for that, Hugh. For more on this topic, go to shop.reasons.org and search for Hidden Treasures in the Book of Job. Now we're going to head to Give and Take, where Jeff Zwerink will talk with Ken Samples about the state of theology. Hello, Jeff Zwerink here, and welcome back to Give and Take, the segment of our show where we explore important scientific ideas to help you be more confident in the truth of Christianity. And today I'm joined by my friend and colleague, Ken Samples, and we're going to be looking at the state of theology in the Christian church today. Ken, it's good to have you back on the show. Good to be with you, Jeff. So I kind of wanted to discuss a, a survey that's been out there, kind of a, a sample of what or survey of what are the beliefs in the Christian church, specifically the evangelical church. It's a, you can go to state, the state of theology.com uh, has the results there. And, uh, right. you know, I just kind of wanted to explore what are some of the findings they have and what does that mean? And, and I, before we start, I just kind of wanted to define a little bit. Uh, they talk about surveying evangelical Christians and they right. define an evangelical Christian as someone who says the Bible is the highest authority for what I believe. It's very important for me to personally encourage non-Christians to trust Jesus Christ as their savior. Jesus Christ's death on the cross is the only sacrifice that could remove the penalty of sin. Mm. And only those who trust in Jesus alone as their Savior receive God's free gift of eternal salvation. Mm -hmm. So at least for a, a significant number of the questions they ask, people agreed to all of those statements. 
What was interesting, though, and I, and I want to get, try and get your thoughts on this, sure. is that uh, they asked about the Trinity, and they asked, there is only one true God and three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, said that 97% of the evangelicals agreed with that. Thought that was a very yeah. good thing. Shortly after that, they asked then, Jesus is the first and greatest being created by God. Wow. Oh, and anywhere boy. from 70 to 80% of those same people who believe in the Trinity Ouch. agreed to that. Yeah. What do we make of that? You know, when I looked through the survey and thought about it, uh, I would say to me, Jeff, that Christianity is three things. It's a set of beliefs, a collection of values, and a way of life. I thought that the survey reflected that we have uh, challenges in all of those areas. You mentioned specifically doctrine. I mean, it's a, a big problem to say, I believe in the Trinity, and yet I believe the Father created the Son, because the Trinity would say, that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are co-eternal. Uh, they're co-equal. And so Jesus can't be a, a mere creature and have the doctrine of the Trinity. So I'm glad people are affirming the Trinity. I think, though, we need to think more carefully about the implications of that doctrine. You know, and it, and it seems to me to raise uh, an interesting question or something that may help us is that uh, people may say, yes, I believe in the Trinity, that yeah. maybe one thing we need to do is to rather than just say, okay, I know what the Trinity means, is to say, well, okay, let's explore that more. Because sure. it, it kind of yeah. seems to open up some conversations and may reveal some places where we have Big yeah. theological differences, if you will. Well, you know, in much of Christian history, you have what we call a catechism. And the catechisms, either Catholic, Orthodox, or Protestant, they tend to be doctrinal studies that are put in the form of question and answer. You know, what do we mean by the doctrine of the Trinity? What do we mean by the deity and the humanity of Christ? I think that kind of instruction can be very helpful to today. And we've kind of moved away from kind of those catechetical studies, if you will. So let me let me ask this question. So, I um, mean, you know, we're talking about the Trinity, uh, maybe a little misconception about who Jesus is, and I would argue it's a bigger than a little misconception, if yeah, you will. Yeah, very much But, so. you know, how would you respond to the charge? You know, I mean, you've got people here that hold the Bible in high, high regard, realize that Jesus paid for their sins, and want to tell other uh, non-believers yeah, about yeah. that. What does it matter in the big picture if they kind of have some of their doctrine wrong, if you will? Well, it, it is a big matter. I mean, um, again, Christianity is first and foremost a set of beliefs. It is. It relates to our view of God, the person of Christ, how we view salvation. So I, I think the evangelical uh, points that are enumerated at the beginning are, are quite good and, and quite helpful. I, I think, though, uh, John tells us that, you know, if we don't believe that Jesus has come in the flesh, uh, that's the doctrine of the Antichrist. Uh, Paul tells us that if we believe in salvation by works, you know, uh, we can be condemned. So it is important what we believe. And, I, and again, I would say Christianity is first a set of beliefs, but it also involves a collection of values that are discussed in this survey, mm -hmm. and it's the way we live our life. And, and I think we have to, we have to you know, be solid in all three of those areas. You know, your response there reminds me of another uh, question they had yeah. that I think relates to how do we live and what do we think and how we sure. interact. Uh, you, know, you talked about uh, Jesus' payment for our sins, said that uh, they put a statement on there, everyone sins a little, but people are basically good by nature. Wow. 52% of evangelical Christians agreed with that statement. Yeah. Yeah, again... A, a very critical doctrine. Um, you know, theologically, we call it original sin, that all human beings have, have taken a fallen nature from, from Adam and Eve. So all of us are, are sinful by nature. All of us are guilty in, in Adam. Uh, there are parts of Christendom that, that, you know, bicker with this or that, but uh, as sinners, we need a Savior, and we, we've sinned not only in the poor decisions and the bad actions we've done, but Scripture talks about sin being part of our fallen nature, and so that's uh, missing a major uh, theological issue. Well, it would seem to me this adopting such a view that we're kind of, yeah, we sin a little, but we're basically good by nature, that would also impact 
how you would go about evangelizing, if you will, and spreading sure. the gospel. Because it seems to have this connotation of, well, you need a little more help. You know, you may need a little more help than right. I do, but you just kind of, you're, you're basically good. It seems yeah. that the bad doctrine actually influences how you're thinking about things well. Well, and, and I think if we talk about Jesus as our Savior, he has, he has rescued us. He's come into the world to do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. Uh, you know, a total depravity, a, a, a theological expression, doesn't mean we're as evil as we can be. But I think the survey indicates we've still got a lot of work to do when it comes to doctrine. Uh, and we haven't mentioned values, and it seems there are work mm. to be done there as well. I want to throw out, uh, you've written a, a blog where you talk about Yaroslav Pelican and, he, Pelican, and he makes a comment in there that the, the church is always more than a school, yeah. but the church can never be less than a school. Mm. That would seem to impact this discussion quite a bit. I, I love that quote. Uh, Pelican was a historian at Yale, uh, Christian theologian, scholar. I think he hits it right on the head, Jeff. Uh, the church is many things. It's a place we worship. It's a place we engage in fellowship. It could be a hospital, a counseling center. The church functions in many ways, but there's one thing the church has to be. It has to be a school. It's a place where we teach people truth and that we, we think truth is sacred and we value it. So I always say, if I came to your church, would I detect that it's a school? And if it's not, then we have a lot of work to do. Well, thanks, Ken. I appreciate your comments. You know, Ken has written a blog about this. It's Thursday Theology from Yaroslav Pelikan, where he talks about some of the things Pelikan identifies that we really need to do well in the church and getting our theology right. And it is so important, uh, especially at Reasons to Believe, we're very big on apologetics, but we're apologetics for evangelism so that we can spread the truth of the gospel. We want to be out sharing the gospel, but we want to make sure we're spreading the right message. So make sure you're studying being in school, learning good theology so that you can spread the message of Christ to everyone around. That does it for us this week on 2819. We hope you enjoyed this episode and that it helped equip you to share your faith with confidence and compassion. And don't forget, subscribe to the show and search for us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We are at 2819 Show and we'd love to hear from you. You can also get the podcast version of our show. Just search Reasons to Believe Podcast wherever you listen to yours. See you next week.